So let's refresh our memories a little bit from last time. When we were talking about IR, infrared spectroscopy. So we've got two axes. What's on the x axis? Wave number. Wave number, which is in reciprocal centimeters. Okay, so wave number. What's on the y axis? Percent. Transmittance, right? So that's what the IR spectrum is going to look like in terms of the axes. Where do we start? What number? Where do we start? Yeah, so we're going to start at 1500. We're going to draw a line, right? We're going to find 1500. I'm just going to say it's here. And we're going to draw a line. Everything to the right of 1500 is what region? The fingerprint region, right? Fingerprint. Those of you in forensics, that sounds interesting, right? But for our purposes, what are we going to do with it? We're going to ignore it. Yeah, we're going to ignore it because it's kind of complicated. So we're just going to ignore this region for the purposes of this class. So we're going to ignore it. What else? Yeah, we're going to now we're going to step to the left in increments of what? Percent transmitted. Okay, so, so what did you say? You said in 500. in 500 increments, right? So we're going to start at 1500. We're going to jump over to 2000. We're going to draw another line. So what's between 1500 and 2000? I heard it. SP2 region. Right? And this is where we're going to find things like what? Things that are double bond bound, right? So you're going to find carbon oxygen double bonds, carbon carbon double bonds, carbon nitrogen double bonds, right? But in each case, the carbon will be sp2 hybridized. Okay? So you'll find that kind of stuff there. Now we take another 500 step to 2500. And I'm not drawing these to scale, so don't. And what's this region? This is the SP region, right? This is where you'll find carbon-carbon triple bonds, carbon-nitrogen triple bonds, carbon-oxygen double bonds that are two of them to a carbon. All the carbons there will be SP hybridized. You will find them there. What do we call the region from 2,500 all the way over to 4,000? This is the hydrogen region. Right? And if you really think about it, the fingerprint region is really the SP3 region. So it's easy to remember. Three, two, one. Right? And it makes sense. We're going in higher energy because in SP3, a single bond is weaker than a double bond is weaker than a triple bond, right? So it takes more energy to stretch these things and make them wiggle and waggle and all the things that they do. Right? So it makes, it makes perfect sense. And in the hydrogen region, Right, if we find something that looks like that, what would that be indicative of? Alcohol. Yeah, this would be something like an alcohol. If we find something that looks like this, and then also has something here, that would be a carboxylic acid. All right, carboxylic acid is pretty, pretty nasty looking OH stretch. Okay, but it, nonetheless, that's that's where it appears. Okay. Isn't the alcohol going to be the uh, yeah, it will be, again, I'm not drawing the perfect scale, but it'll be more symmetrical, it'll look like a parabola. Uh, I wonder if amines have like a unique hydrogen region. Amines come around where alcohols are, but you can tell they're usually weaker. Okay. And if you have a doublet, that's usually a primary amine. Uh. If you have a singlet, what we call a singlet, it would be a secondary amine. 
And that makes sense. Why would I see two peaks for a primary mean? Because there are two hydrogens. And that's, okay, there are two hydrogens, but why would they appear in two different spots? How can I stretch those hydrogens? So if I'm the nitrogen and my fists are the hydrogens, I can stretch this way, which is, is symmetrical. Both hydrogens are stretching at the same time. Or I can do this. And those take are, occur at different frequencies. And that's why you see that. But if I'm a secondary mean, I've only got one hydrogen. There's only one thing I can do with it, right? And that's why it appears. And then if I'm a tertiary hydrogen, or a mean, I don't have any hydrogens, I'm not going to see anything there, right? So that makes, that makes sense. Okay? So IR is good to determine functional groups. But if I give you a molecule that has or if I give you two or three molecules and they all have the same functional groups, are you going to be able to look at an IR spectrum and tell me which one it is? Probably not. You would need to do a lot of investigating in the fingerprint region, which is too complicated for us right now. Right? So if I gave you four carboxylic acids that are all aliphatic carboxylic acids, they all have the same functional groups, you probably wouldn't be able to tell the difference with them based on IR. But what you would be able to tell me is, hey, I've got some type of carboxylic acid. Okay? So we need another technique that helps us distinguish different types of molecules, and that's where NMR spectroscopy comes in. One thing that we need to cover before we get into NMR spectroscopy, though, is the index of hydrogen deficiency. Okay? IHD. It's in your book. And that's going to be equal to the number of hydrogens in a reference compound minus the number of hydrogens that you have in the molecule divided by 2. It's a pretty simple little equation. I wouldn't worry about memorizing the equation because it makes sense once you understand what we're looking at. So let's take benzene as an example. What's the molecular formula for benzene? C6H6. I've got six carbons and six hydrogens. And I want to calculate the index of hydrogen deficiency. I need a reference compound. The reference compound is going to be based on the number of carbons. How many, what is the maximum number of hydrogens an organic molecule can have if it had six carbons? Well, that would be hexane. One, two, three, four, five, six, right? And that would be three there, two, 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 and three. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, one, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Fourteen hydrogens is the maximum number that six carbons can have. So this is my reference number. Fourteen. My molecule has six. Divided by two is equal to what? I do that arithmetic, what's the number? Four. Four. I never learned this as IHD, we always called this the unsaturation number. Okay. But benzene has an unsaturation number or an IHD of four. How do we have four? Okay, so the ring is one, I have to, and then the three double bonds, right? Theoretically, I could add eight hydrogen atoms, which is four H2s, to this molecule to get this, right? So that's the index of hydrogen deficiency, which is, comes in handy when you're trying to solve an unknown structure. Do that one. How would we calculate that? What would the reference be? Okay, well, what is the reference supposed to be? I'm just kind of going. The number of carbons. 
How many carbons do I have? Three. Three, right? So it's C3. This is C3H what? Whoops. H6. So if I had three carbons, that would be propane. How many hydrogens would that have? Eight. So that's the reference is eight. Okay, how did you get to that reference? Three carbons. How many, what's the maximum number of hydrogens of three carbons? Yep, and that would be eight. That would be my reference. All right. Today we're going to talk about NMR spectroscopy. If you had to ask a chemist, what one instrument would you make sure that your lab had access to, it would be this technique called NMR spectroscopy. Okay? It is by far the most powerful single technique that we have to determine the structure of organic molecules. And you all are already familiar with NMR spectroscopy because you know a little something about nuclear magnetic resonance imaging. Okay? This is an MRI machine. You've probably seen one if you've ever been to the hospital or know somebody that's, that's actually been in one, right? So MRI uh, is an instrument that allows us to visualize the body in ways that we were never able to visualize it before, okay? This big thing that you see right here is a superconducting magnet, okay? So a uh, very high magnetic field, they place the patient inside a strong magnetic field, and basically what we do is we flip your protons in water. We flip them from one state to the other, and they're able then to take all that information and build these nice, beautiful images of a human uh, anat of different pieces of the anatomy and uh, do this very easily. The nice thing about this is it's non-invasive. The doctor doesn't have to cut you open much anymore to see what's inside. And x-rays have their, their place, but MRI is a heck of a lot better than x-rays in a lot of, in a lot of, uh, a lot of examples, okay? This was such an important development in medicine that it was awarded the 2003 Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine for this development. Okay? It's nothing to go and the doctor order an MRI for you. You know, you, you're in a car accident, you think you may have a concussion, they'll order an MRI. We can see in without having to drill, cut, prod, poke, the whole nine yards. It's relatively painless. The only thing people really have to worry about in terms of pain is um, uh, if you have excess metal in your body, because it's a magnetic field, that will cause pain. Uh, and uh, people are typically, uh, people who are typically a bit claustrophobic uh, will have a problem with MRI, because you're in a controlled, sp a confined space, and it does create a little bit of anxiety, okay? Now, uh, chemists have been using the equivalent of what's called uh, MRI uh, in the lab for over 60 years now, I think, okay? And that's what M NMR is. NMR is the MRI of organic molecules. But instead of getting pretty little pictures like this, we get what we call spectra that look something like this. So here's an example of a molecule, an organic molecule, and here's its NMR spectrum. What kind of molecule is this? PP3? Pardon? No, what kind of molecule is? What's the functional group? Ether. It's an ether, yeah. It's got a CH3, which is a methyl group attached to an oxygen, which is attached to another carbon. This carbon happens to be part of a tert-butyl group. All right, so this is called methyl tert-butyl ether, MTBE. It used to be used as a gasoline additive. It is no longer used as a gasoline additive uh, because it had a habit of leaking into groundwater, uh, which was not, not uh, particularly, particularly good, uh, but it was an oxygenating agent that was added to uh, gasoline to make, make your car run better, uh, less pollution. Uh, and what you can see from this is when we place this in an NMR, 
we get something that looks like this. Okay? What does that look like? Describe it to me. What kind of information are we starting to see there? What are we looking at? Is it like the electrons being energized or something? Not quite. Am I looking at carbons here? Am I looking at hydrogens? Am I looking at the oxygen? What are we looking at? What is this, what is giving rise to this signal? These signals. This is proton in a more. So what am I looking at? Which come from where? These come from the hydrogens. So we're actually looking at the hydrogen NMR spectroscopy, okay? These are the hydrogens of the methyl group that give rise to this peak. These are the hydrogens of the butyl group that give rise to this peak, okay? If you look at this ratio, it says there's 20 and 60. That's a three to one ratio. Notice there's a three to one ratio of uh, different types of hydrogen. So I can start to count the hydrogens relatively speaking. Notice that the signals are in different locations on this scale, whatever the scale means, right? These are the two signals. So what's this thing here? They've accounted for everything here, right? So what's this thing? What's that thing at zero? Uh, number of hydrogens on the lone C car carbon? Uh. Nope. Those are right there, right? That's the CH3. That's this peak. So what's this? Turns out we have to add a compound to the molecule or to the sample to know where zero is. It's called a reference compound, okay? And by definition, we set it at zero. It's called tetramethylsilane, TMS. Anything that you see at zero, for the purposes of this class, you can ignore it. It's the reference, okay? It allows us to tell the spectrometer that this is zero, and it allows you to set the scale, okay? Otherwise, it doesn't know what's one, what's two, what's three, what's four in terms of chemical shifts. So you have to define it. And we define it by adding this thing called TMS. Okay? So what you'll see if you look at this, these look like nice little single peaks, right? Just little lines going up. But when we look at a molecule that actually has some other stuff in it, a little different, we start to see some differences, okay, there's our TMS, we're gonna ignore that. Here's our red peak, here's our blue peak. Notice that they colored the hydrogens in for us, easy to see. What's different about this spectrum versus this spectrum? It has more peaks. It has more peaks. We call this splitting, okay? So if you look at A, A belongs to these two hydrogens. But it's not a single line like it is over here, right? It's these four lines in this one to two to two to one ratio, okay? It's one signal that's been split into four peaks, okay? And it belongs to this CH2. These, what is that, pink, pepto-bismol or something, whatever, color, right? Uh, it is, these three hydrogens, okay, this is B, and this is just a blow up so you can see the splitting, right? How is that different than this one? Stronger. Stronger, okay, what else? Is the splitting the same? No. It's like a three. Yeah, it looks like a kind of maybe a one to two to one, right? Kind of ratio, right? So what's going on with this? Why are things split? Well, we're going to learn about that today. So this is going to be important. This is where 
NMR is very, very powerful because it tells you, okay, once you're, once you're a little bit skilled in this, it tells you the signal, but it also tells you what it's connected to. It tells you how many neighboring protons are there. So you get, the, you get a lot of pieces to a puzzle. So when I see a spectrum like this, I know that this is what we call a triplet because it has three peaks. Okay, that means that the hydrogens that are giving rise to this signal have two neighboring hydrogens. So this CH3 is connected to a CH2. I can tell that by the splitting. And I can tell that these two hydrogens have three neighbors because it's split into four peaks. It's called the N plus one rule. Okay. Where N is the number of neighboring hydrogens. So B, right, is a triplet because it has two neighboring hydrogens. And two plus one is what? Three. That's why I get three peaks. Okay. These two hydrogens have how many neighbors? Three. And so it appears as? Four. Four peaks. N plus one. Okay. So you can start to see how you put things together. Okay. But you can also see that this CH2 has a higher number for this so-called chemical shift than does B, right? B is closer to TMS. A is further away from TMS. Chemical shift tells us also what's kind of attached to it. What's attached to A that's not attached to B? A bromine. What do we know about bromine? Is it electronegative or electropositive? Negative. Negative. And so what does this seem to tell you then? A is attached to something that is more electromagnetic. It has like a partial positive. It does, and so that pushes it to higher number, right? This one's only attached to another carbon. It's further this way, right? So as you go further and further down the scale, you can usually tell what's attached, okay? You are not, so I don't want you all to panic. You are not going to get to a point where you're going to be able to interpret these things with great skill at the end of this class, okay? It takes years. My graduate student is excellent at this. He's been doing it for four years. He's had graduate courses in this. Okay? Um, but we're going to cover the basics of it anyway because it is an important technique for you all to have a little bit of an understanding. Okay? Now, why does this work? Yeah? How would we get this on a test? We'll see some examples. I'll show you some examples. Okay? So it turns out that a proton in certain elements, right? Remember, elements are composed of a nucleus and then the electron cloud, right? And the nucleus is composed of neutro or neutrons and or protons and or neutrons, right? So uh, it turns out that protons are charged. What's the charge on a proton? Positive. Positive, right? But it also turns out that they spin like the Earth. They have a spin to them. My physics friends would, would yell at me for saying that they spin like the Earth. But they do have what we call spin. Okay? If you take something that is charged and you move it, what do you create? Well, you do create a force, but that force is magnetism. Okay? If you think about the old days of building an electromagnet when you were in grade school, take a nail, you wrap wire around it, and then you put a current through it, and it's, it'll pick up other nails. Same thing happens here. When we take something that's charged and we move it, we create a magnetic field, okay? These are just like little tiny bar magnets. Your body right now has these little protons spinning around and they act like magnets, okay? And so they have a north pole and a south pole just like a bar magnet does, okay? This is why you can actually detect these things because they have a magnetic field. Okay. Now, if I take that spinning proton, it creates a magnetic field, and we're going to just arbitrarily say that the magnetic field is going in the direction of the arrow that you're seeing here through the ball. Okay, so from here to here. Okay, so think of it as south and north. Okay, and if I took a bunch of protons and I scattered them out on the table, you would go around and you would observe them, and you would find that their magnetic fields point in random directions. Okay? If we didn't have a magnetic field in this room. Okay? So that's 
So with no external field, these things just point all over the place. Wait, so is that why in a compass it points to like to north? Yeah. Yeah, it points north because like the, if there's an electromagnetic field close to it, it'll point to it. It'll point to it, that's right. Yeah. Is that why? That's exactly why. The Earth creates a magnetic field because its core spins. It's a liquid metal core with a bunch of electrons that's spinning and it creates a north and a south pole. Okay? And the same thing's happening here on, on, this, on this scale. Okay? Now, if I take this sample of protons and I place them in a magnetic field, magnetic field, physicists for whatever reason call that B, B0. Okay? So that's a magnetic field. So I'm taking these and I'm placing them in the MRI machine. Okay? And the MRI machine has a big mag magnet, right? You will find that they no longer orient randomly. They can either align with the magnetic field or they can oppose the magnetic field. That's it. It's quantized. The magnet can either align with the magnetic field or it can oppose it. It can't be halfway in between or somewhere. It can't be random anymore. That's what happens when they place you in the MRI machine. All of your water aligns with the magnetic field. And you will actually feel that a little bit. It kind of creates a little bit of a sensation, okay? But you'll see it. So we're spin flipping your protons, okay? And so since we have two states, we can actually detect which protons are in one state or the other pretty easily, okay? And so, as you might expect, once we place the sample in the magnetic field, we've got the low energy state and we've got the high energy state. Why is this the low energy state? Because it's going with the direction of the... That's right. It's aligned with the magnetic field. Okay? So it aligns with the magnetic field. This one is the higher energy state because... Because it's against the magnetic field. Okay? We can measure this energy difference. And it turns out that this occurs in the radio wave area of the electromagnetic spectrum. So what do we do to your body? We've aligned your protons. We actually send a radio wave into the MRI machine that gives your protons enough energy to go from the lowest energy state to the top energy state. We can measure how much energy it takes to do that. Okay? And when we do that, we can build those images. And in the case of NMR, we can build the spectrum. Okay? So we say that this is the one-half spin state, this is the minus one-half spin state. Don't worry about all that quantum nonsense, okay? Just lower energy, higher energy, and we can measure that energy difference, okay? You only have two nuclear spin states once you place it in a NMR spectrometer. This is what an NMR spectrometer looks like. It kind of looks like R2-D2 in a way. In the middle is a superconducting magnet that is immersed in a bath of liquid helium. Okay, so my wife is the one that maintains this instrument for us. We have one of these upstairs. It's, a, it's called a 400 megahertz NMR. Don't worry about that too much. But it looks like little R2-D2. And every couple of months, she has to refill it with liquid helium. But every week, she has to fill it with liquid nitrogen. So it's got these two ports. One of them is for liquid helium that the magnet is stuck in. And then the other one is for liquid nitrogen that is on the outside. Okay. Liquid helium is extremely expensive. Um, the government, in its wisdom, has decided to get rid of the National Helium Reserve, which is a mistake in my opinion. Um, for those of you, a couple of years ago, if you went and tried to buy helium balloons, you wouldn't have been able to. Because there are times when our helium reserve gets so low that they reserve all of the helium for medical applications, MRI, and you can't buy helium balloons. Okay? Uh, and makes sense. We want to be able to save people's lives as opposed to have parties, right? So uh, that happens. So uh, just a little tidbit. But the, the nitrogen serves as a buffer to the, to the, to the room so that it uh, uh, keeps that nitrogen longer. So it's really a thermos inside a thermos. Think of it that way. One of the thermoses has the magnet and one of the thermoses uh, with, with the helium and the other thermos has liquid nitrogen. This is all connected to a computer, of course, and a bunch of electronics. You put your sample in up here in what's called an NMR tube. It lowers it down into the, into the magnet, and then you control everything with the computer. 
and you send radio frequency to the NMR so that you can get your spectrum. Okay? And it does it through some complicated math called Fourier transform, free induction decay, don't worry about all that kind of stuff. Uh, but you can ultimately get your spectrum. So that's how it works. Okay? So let's get to the meat of what you really need to know. Okay? You need to know each one of these bullet points. Protons, and when I say protons, when I'm talking about this, I'm talking about hydrogen atoms. So remember that. Protons in different environments will absorb at slightly different frequencies. So you're going to have to, on the exam, be able to tell me how many different environments there are for protons. We'll do some examples. The frequency at which a particular proton absorbs is determined by its electronic environment. Is it attached to something that's electronegative or not? If it's attached to something that's electronegative, it's going to be pulled to a higher number a little bit. Okay. The size of the magnetic field generated by the electrons around the proton determines where it absorbs. Again, so if there's a lot of electrons around it, it's going to absorb differently than if there's fewer electrons around it. And then, this is kind of important, only nuclei that contain an odd mass number or odd atomic numbers give rise to NMR signals. If you're an element that has an even mass number and an even atomic number, you are NMR silent. Your protons do not spin. Okay? Protons will not spin for something that is even in both of these. Okay? So, for example, I can see hydrogen. Hydrogen has a mass number of one. One is an odd number. I can see carbon-13. That's kind of nice. Most organic molecules contain hydrogen and carbon. But I can also see fluorine-19, and I can see phosphorus-31. And I can see others. But these are the ones that are kind of common to, to chemists. And again, you can also be odd atomic numbers, right? So I can actually see nitrogen-14, even though that has an even mass number, Nitrogen has an odd, seven. yeah, it has number seven for the uh, atomic number. So we can, we can see these types of things. Are the other people like provided the atomic and mass numbers or are those the ones? Those are on the periodic, periodic table. table. Yep, they're on the periodic table. Wait, can you point out the, like which one is which? Which one is what? On a periodic table, like which one is the atomic number? Well, the atomic number will be above the element. Yeah. Like hydrogen is, has a one above it. So that's the atomic number. The number that's below is the mass number. Yeah. All right. You're going to have to figure out the number of NMR signals. And the number of NMR signals has to do with symmetry. So for example, if you look at dimethyl ether, for example, it is only going to give rise to one NMR signal. So this is dimethyl ether. Okay, so I've got the two CH3s and I've got the oxygen. Why is this only going to give me one NMR signal? I've got, CH, I've got two CH3s, right? So why do I only see one NMR signal? It's symmetrical. This methyl group and this methyl group are identical. If I flip it around, and I didn't show you that I flipped around, you couldn't tell the difference, could you? So that means that these protons and these protons are in identical environments. So I'm going to see one peak. Okay? One and only one peak. Now if I take, let's use blue. Let's say blue is chlorine. Now if I take or chloroethane, I'm going to get two NMR signals. I'm going to get one for the CH3 and I'm going to get one for the CH2. Why is that? 
Not symmetrical. Symmetrical if I look at it down there. It's because they're different. Different environment. Okay, so the, this, these two hydrogens are on a carbon that's attached to a chlorine, right? Mm -hmm. And another carbon. What are, what are these attached to? A carbon. Only one carbon. Only a carbon. These are clearly different, right? So I'm going to get a signal for this CH3, and I'm going to get a signal for the CH2. I'm going to get two signals. Now if I add one more carbon to dimethyl ether and make it methyl ethyl ether, or ethyl methyl ether I should say, I'm going to get three NMR signals. There's no longer symmetry around the oxygen, right? This CH3 is different than this CH2 and is different than this CH3. Even though these are both CH3s, they are different. That's right. This CH3 is attached to a oxygen. And this one is attached to a carbon. carbon. So it's going to get, I'm going to see a signal here, a signal here, and a signal there. I'm going to see three types of NMR signals. When you say signal, do you mean a peak on that blown up that we, sh that we saw, or do you mean a separate one, like the blue one and the red one? It'll be like the blue one and the red one. So they, they might be split, <laughs> but. So splitting is within that. It's within the signal. Yeah. So these three have two neighbors, so this should be split into a triple, but it's one signal. <coughs> but it's one signal. It's so this one would signal. have like three different color signals. Like that's right. Red, blue, and yellow, or whatever we want to call it. Yeah, that's how it would appear. Okay. So you're going to end up with three types of NMR signals for this particular molecule. This is going to be central to most of the things that you do on the exam, being able to identify the number of signals, okay? Because you're going to be able to eliminate a lot of things just based on the number of signals. Right, if I gave you an NMR spectrum and I showed you this molecule and there were five signals in the NMR spectrum, this can't be the choice, can it? Right? Okay. Now, things get a little more complicated when you start to talk about rings. If you drew this ring, it doesn't tell you everything. You need to build a model or draw it out in three dimensions. So let's say we have, we'll use this blue one again as our chlorine. Okay? You'll see that I've got three carbons and a chlorine and I've got two, four, five hydrogen atoms, right? And I have to determine how many hydrogen atom environments do I have? How many do you think I have? think I have two? Okay, so you think these and this? Yeah. Okay, so there's a, there's a plane of symmetry, right? Which means that these have to be identical. This is clearly different, right? But wait a second. Right, so this has to be equivalent to this, and this has to be equivalent to this, but does this have to be equivalent to that? Mm, no. Do the trans hydrogens have to be equivalent? No. Why not? The upper one is closer to the... To the chlorine. Yeah. That's a different environment than this one, right? Yeah. So I want to see one, two, three different signals for this particular molecule. Wait, what about the hydrogens inside? Are there no hydrogens in the chlorine? No, these are just lone pairs. pairs. Yeah. Okay. It's just CO. Yeah. So I'll see this, I'll see these, and I'll see these. Okay? The same thing with alkenes. If you drew it out like this, it would be hard to tell how many signals you have. But now when I look at it like this, how many would you say you have? Which two? The bottom six ones and the top one. So you say these are the same and then this one? Yeah. Okay. Or three because is that one attached to the so that one? Ah, there you go. You found your mistake. Now what? Now where are you going to go with it? Three. Three, right? And I can't, I can't point to it with that stupid monitor. But this hydrogen is attached to the carbon with the chlorine. These two hydrogens are just attached to a carbon. But this one's closer to the chlorine than this one, right? So it's one, two, three different environments. Looking at it like that, you would be very difficult to tell. You've got to look at it in three dimensions. Okay. 
So let's look at a couple other examples, just figuring out the number of signals. So here we have 1,2-dichloroethane. Chlorine atom on number one, chlorine atom on number two. It's only going to give us one signal. These CH2s are identical. If I'd made it and I flipped it around, you couldn't tell that I flipped it around. Right? There's a mirror plane of symmetry through here that makes this CH2 and this CH2 equivalent. You're going to get one in a Mars suit. Okay? If I take this molecule, right? Bromo, uh, uh, one bromo, uh, three chloropropane, I end up with three different types of signals. There's no mirror symmetry here. Bromine is clearly different than chlorine, right? Did I say that right? Bromine is clearly different than chlorine. I end up with three different signals, HA, HB, and HC. I'm going to see three different types of NMR signals. If I look at this molecule, both of them contain CH3, but are they equivalent? Why not? Okay, this one's attached to the oxygen, and this one is attached to carbon. carbon. That's right. So I'm going to see two NMR signals for this particular molecule. Okay? And then for our good friend ethanol, I'm going to see three types of signals. Right? OH will show up as a signal, <coughs> HB will show up, and the CH3 or HA as they have them listed there will also show up. There are three different types of signals. People use NMR spectroscopy to determine the quality of your vodka. You go buy vodka and it says it's a certain percentage. They actually determine that percentage by taking the vodka, putting it in an NMR spectrometer and measuring the ratio of vodka to water. Okay, You can do that in an NMR uh, spectrometer very, very easily. So there are practical applications for this kind of stuff, other than just torturing organic chemistry students on an exam. Okay? Yeah, please answer that. No, I as it is. All right. So the first thing that you're going to need to do is count the number of signals to determine how many unique environments are in a molecule. When I give you an exam question with NMR, count the number of signals and eliminate anything that doesn't have that number of signals. So if you were to look at an NMR spectrum and you go, that only has one signal, anything that had two, three, four, five, whatever, can't be the answer, right? So that's the very first thing you're going to want to do, okay? So how many signals do I have here? Three. I have three. Remember, we ignore TMS. That's our reference. That's zero, <laughs> and it's tiny here. They didn't put a lot in. But I see a signal here, I see a signal here, and I see a signal here. This is just what we call an inset blow up, where they've taken this and expanded it so you can see the split, okay? So we've just determined that this molecule has three unique environments for, uh, for the spectrum, okay? We know the molecular formula. I will typically give you the molecular formula uh, if it's an unknown. Uh, and this is C3H7Br, right? So I know a little bit already. Okay. I can see the splitting. I can count the peaks. I can do all kinds of stuff. But we've determined that there are three unique proton environments in this molecule. Okay? You're then going to do kind of what you did in um, infrared. You're going to start somewhere. And where we start in NMR is not quite as well defined as where you start in IR. Okay? But if you were to look at this, can you, I mean, these are different regions. Where would you want to start? Where might you draw a line? The 6.5. Okay, somewhere around, around here. Why, why did you pick that? Okay, that's not that's not uh, non-rational. That's, that's a rational argument, and it's close. It's not exactly where I would draw the line. And I'll tell you why here in just a second. Anybody else have a guess? Four point five. Four point five. Okay, argue argue it for me. You're a little closer. Selena was 
close, you're a little closer. Why did you pick him? Why did you pick it, Jason? I thought the I thought the one the the region between two point five and one point five was also SP three, but apparently it's not. Never mind. Oh, but you're starting to think about SP three and SP two and SP, but right? Is it two point five because it's like SP two and then SP three and then SP three and SP two, so there's a there's an order. There's a little bit of an order there. It turns out that anywhere from about zero all the way to about five, five is where I'm going to draw the line. Everything to the right of five is either going to be SP hybridized or SP3 hybridized. Notice this hydrogen is still on an SP3 hybridized carbon atom. SP3 hybridized carbon atom, SP3 hybridized carbon atom, SP3 hybridized carbon atom. So I say everything to the right of five, which we say is upfield. As you get closer to zero, you call that upfield, okay? And I know that this is gonna be my SP3 region and kind of between 1.7 and you know, somewhere around two is gonna be SP. Everything to the left, so five and higher, right? Are hydrogens that are attached to things like SP2 hybridized carbon atoms. So aromatic rings, alkenes, and then you've got you know, an aldehyde that's attached to an SP2 hybridized carbon atom. And then carboxylic acids, the OH will also appear way out here around 12. Kind of like the hydrogen region in the um, IR spectrum, okay? So upfield is SP3 and downfield is SP2. Yep. Yep. Closer you are to zero, we call that upfield. The further away from zero you are, we call that downfield. This hydrogen would appear downfield of this hydrogen. Okay, so that's just kind of some terminology. Okay, and what we call the chemical shift. Okay, these rough regions would be a good thing for you to have in your notebook. But you're going to start at five. You can actually look these values up in the table. Your book has a table of kind of ranges where you're going to find different types of hydrogen. But you're not really going to have time to use that on an exam. Okay, you're going to have to use kind of rough government figures. Okay? So, it's not those tables, it's different tables. But you do have chemical shift tables in your book. And so you can look at the different regions and see where the peaks come in and you can get an idea. So if I see peaks in this region from about 6.5 to about 8, I'm guessing, educatedly, that that's probably hydrogen attached to some type of benzene ring. If it's out here between 9 and 12, it's going to be either an aldehyde or a carboxylic acid. If it's here around 1 to 1 and a half, it's going to be some kind of alkane uh, molecule. Okay? So you can get kind of the rough ranges pretty easily by looking at that. Okay? The third thing you're going to do is you're going to determine the relative number of hydrogens that you have. This is called integration. Anybody know what integration means? Integration is nothing more than the area under a curve. Okay, it's calculus. Okay? You integrate something, you're getting the relative weight, if you will, of that particular signal. Okay? So, for example, these little squiggly lines that you see over each signal, these are called integral lines. The NMR spectrometer draws these lines. You can literally take a ruler and measure these. Or you can ask the computer just to spit out the number. But if you took a ruler, you would find that this is 1 to measure from here to here. This distance is the same distance as this one, so these protons have to be in a 1 to 1 ratio. And you'll see that this is about one and a half times the distance as this one. So the relative ratio for these protons is 1 to 1 to 1 1.5. What's the problem with a fractional ratio? It's or a fractional number? It's, it's not very, it's not fractional. It's, it's not fractional. Why isn't it fractional? You can't have 1.5 hydrogens. Can't have 1.5 hydrogens, can I? Uh, you just do a twisted question. 
Yeah. But also. So what can I do? There are, you know, like if it's one to one to one point five, it can be two to two to three, or it can be four to four to six. Can be. We can we can just multiply through, right? But what do I know here? I've been given the molecular formula, right? Oh yeah. So how many how should I have? What's the total? Should seven. Have? Seven. So if I multiplied everything through by two, that would give me a two to two to three, which is seven. Seven, right? So I know that this is a CH two. I know that this has to be a CH two, and that by definition has to be a CH three, right? There's three hydrogens on that carbon, right? So integration gives you the number of hydrogens. Tells me the relative number of hydrogens. Yes. I know that the relatively I've got 1 to 1 to 1 1.5, but as Jason mentioned, I can multiply by through and get 2 to 2 to 3, or I could have multiplied through by 4 and gotten 4 to 4 to 8, uh, or 6, excuse me, 6, right? But I know what the formula is, so I know that it has to add up to 7, so I'm going to multiply it through by 2. All right. The last thing you need to do is you need to interpret that splitting pattern. Okay. This is where it gets... Dicey? Dicey? No. This is where it takes a lot of practice. Okay. Your book has a table. I like this table better. Okay. But you'll notice if a molecule has two hydrogens that are different, A and B, and by definition these are different because they label them A and B. Okay. What do you notice? You notice that HA has one neighbor, so it'll be two. two, which we call a doublet. And HB also has one neighbor, so it'll appear as two. And we get an HA, HB, we call this uh, a pair of doublets. Okay? So I know, since this signal is a doublet, that this proton has to have two neighbors, and I know that this proton also has to have two neighbors. I can get that pretty easily from this. If you look at HA and HB in, in example number two, HA has how many neighbors? Two. Two, so it's going to appear as a triplet, triplet right? It's going to have three peaks. And these two have how many neighbors? Wait, where does this one have two? Is it between the CH two here, right? Right there, CH two. So these two protons have how many neighbors? One. One. So it's going to be a doublet. A doublet, right? It's going to appear as two peaks, right? So we're going to have a triplet and a doublet. Okay. Here we have two proton or two signals that aren't equivalent, and they both have two neighbors, so they're going to appear as triplets, right? Here we have one where you have two in this signal that have three neighbors, so it's going to be four, and this signal has two neighbors, so it's going to be three. Right, so we can start to put all this together pretty easily. So if we have one signal that appears as one peak, we call that a singlet. If we have two peaks like this, we call that a doublet. If we have three peaks like this, we call that a triplet. If we have four peaks that look like this, we call that a quartet. So you need to be able to identify singlet, doublet, triplet, and quartet. Beyond that, we just call them multiplets for this course, okay? Anything that has more peaks than four, just call it a multiple, okay? So, given all that, I want you all to take about three or four minutes, work in your pairs, and I want you to put together what this molecule has to be. You know that it's C3H7Br, you know what the atoms are, you know what the integrations are. It's 1 to 1 to 1 1.5. Put together what you think the molecule, molecular structure is for this molecule. You can't do it in your head. Start putting pieces together. <coughs> does the height of the peak of the cells matter? It does, but we're not getting into that. Okay.
Those are the integrations. And it's not labeled, but that's 1 to 1 to 1 1.5. Number two, this one? Yes. One, two, three, four, five, six, looks like to me. Yeah. Looks like it's got six peaks in its splitting pattern. Tell me how everything's connected together. What what's the what does the molecule look like? Snap a picture of it real quick. Figured it out? Alright folks, what do I need to do? Two sets of hydrogens? How many how many environments do I have? I have three environments, right? And those seven hydrogens have to be in those three environments somehow. Yes. Right? So I think that's where you're trying to come up with an extra. Yes. Right? It means that one of the carbons is gonna have an odd number. Yes. Okay. We can we can we can agree with that. All right, what else can I do? I I kind of split it like I put all the information down and then I was I'm not sure if I connected it right or not, but it's like we have one of the hydrogens, the, the two, like the, um, let's label them ABC for, for now. ABC? Yeah. Okay. And then, so that A has two hydrogens. Okay, because of the integration. Because of the integration. Okay, and I also know how many neighbors does it have. And you also, it has two neighbors. And, and I know that because it's A. Because uh, it has three peaks. Yeah, we call that A. No. No. Three is B. Oh, true. Triple. Right. Okay? And then B. So you put that in what we would call a structural fragment together. You know that it's going to be something, it's going to be a carbon with two hydrogens. Yeah, it's going to have two neighbors. Okay. Maybe because it's two hydrogens and 
toward the left. And since it's so far downfield, it probably also contains the, ER. the bromine. Yeah, so you can put that piece together. So you can write all that information about that piece. All right, very good. And then the next one is also going to have two. Uh, it's going to be two hydrogens because of the integration, right? And then it's going to have five names. All right, now it's going to have five neighbors. Can those five neighbors be on one carbon? No. We can't have more than four bonds on a carbon, right? So it means it's got to be in the middle of two carbons. One of them is going to have? The bromine, and one is going to be the C3, which is the next one. All right, all right. And then, whoop, yep. Yeah. And then this one is? It has three. Three because of the integration, right? That has two neighbors. It has two neighbors because so it's? The other end of the the other end of the, yeah, furthest away yeah. from the bromine. Okay, so now if I start to put those together, what should the molecule, molecular structure look like? Just C3, C2, C2BR. One bromo. Okay, so what you were doing is you were doing exactly this piece. Right, this is this peak, this is these two hydrogens, and they have two neighbors, right? So that's that. You came up with this piece, right? So these red hydrogens are here. It's going to have a CH3 and a CH2. That's how you get the five neighbors, right? And then this is the CH3. And when you actually put all this together, you get one bromopropane, okay? And that fits the molecular formula, C3H7Br. Okay, three unique environments. They're colored differently, right? This is going to be a triplet. It's going to be the furthest downfield because it's, the carbon has the bromine. And then it's going to pull it downfield. This is going to be the furthest upfield because it's the furthest away from the bromine, which is what you were arguing, right? And then the one in the middle is going to appear halfway in between because it's, it's not directly attached to the bromine, but it's closer than the CH3. And it, it's got the five neighbors, so it's going to be the six peaks, okay? So this little, simple, tiny molecule gives rise to this relatively complex uh, proton NMR spec. Okay? So let's look at some examples, some other examples in the time that we have remaining. How would you name this molecule? Two iodopropane. Will you agree that it should give two signals? A and B, the two A's are going to be the same, B is clearly different, right? Now look at the spectra for this, right? Right, so you have this that's at about 1.8, right, right there. They blew it up so you can see them. It's how many peaks? Two. Two. This CH3 has how many neighbors? One. One. This CH3 has how many neighbors? One. But this is one signal, right? So what would the integration of this signal be? Six. Six. If this is one, then this has to be six times that size, right? Can you see that again? If this is one, this has to be six times that size in terms of the interval line. It's strong. Okay. CH3 plus CH3 is six hydrogens. And you only have one here in the middle for B. Notice what the speak, peak splitting looks like here. Can you count them? How many, how many, what should it be split into? Seven. Seven. Let's see if we can find them. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That last little one gets real tiny, doesn't it? Okay, here we're looking at dichloroethane, 1,1-dichloroethane. Again, you would expect to see two different peaks. B is clearly going to be further downfield. Look where it's at. It's down around 6. It's kind of violating my 5 rule, isn't it? Yeah. But it's because it's attached to 2. <coughs> very electron withdrawing or very electronegative atoms. And so it gets pulled down quite a ways. And this hydrogen has how many neighbors? Three. Three, so it appears as a <coughs> quartet. Okay, it appears as a quartet. It's going to be far, far downfield. This CH3 is going to be further upfield, right? Round two. Uh, and it has how many neighbors? One. So it's a double. Double. And you see that it's a roughly a three to one if you were to get a ruler out and measure this. Okay. Can we, can we go over how we identify the, the neighbors? Is it just what it's like? Yeah, so the neighbors are the immediate, or the carbon that's directly attached to the carbon, right? So if I look at this, right, these three hydrogens are on a carbon that's attached to one other carbon. 
this is a neighboring carbon. Okay. So if it was attached to two carbons, that would be? Yeah, so if we look at this one, right? This carbon is attached to this carbon and that carbon. It has two neighboring carbons. Okay, but what if it was this carbon, but it's attached to that carbon here and the carbon here? Then you have a ring. No, it's a line. Then it can't, it can't be attached. It's not way. attached to it. I mean, are you counting the numbers of carbon? Okay, I'm not sure why I understand what you're getting. If you have a, t a terminal carbon, okay, and so it's attached to one other carbon, and right. the molecule is linear. Okay, so this is a linear molecule. And then the middle carbon is attached to another carbon. It's just three carbons. It's how many carbons? Three carbons. All right. Is it only the carbons directly attached? Yeah, so this carbon has one neighbor. So it wouldn't be two neighbors because they're two carbons. It's just what's directly, directly attached. attached. Yeah. So there's two hydrogens here, right? So this signal has two neighbors. Has two neighbors, so it'll appear as a triplet. Wait, this signal has two neighbors? This signal has two neighbors. Two neighboring hydrogens. Two neighboring hydrogens. Yeah. Then you just said it was one carbon? It is one carbon. And one in the same carbon. It's one carbon. It's one yes. neighboring carbon, but it has two hydrogens. So it's a you gotta count the hydrogens. N plus one rule, where N is the number of neighbor Hydrogen atoms. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Here's an example of uh, one nitro propane. And you'll see that C is further downfield because the nitro group, nitrogen's electronegative, so it pulls it down. Right? You can see all of the peaks. B is the interesting one right here. One, two, three, four, five, six peaks. And that should be because it's got three neighbors here, two neighbors there, right? And then, of course, the furthest one downfield is C uh, as a triplet because it has two neighbor hydrogens, okay? All right. We've got just a couple minutes. So I wanted to just talk to you a little bit about why we see splitting, okay? And it has to do, it's, it's all quantum theory. But it comes from the fact that you, your, your protons can either be aligned with or against the magnetic field. That's the only two options. That's why the n plus 1 rule works. Okay? And so if I'm a signal and I've got neighboring protons, what am I feeling in terms of the magnetic field? I'm feeling the magnetic field of the spectrometer. But the little protons that are my neighbors are also magnets, right? So I'm feeling them, okay? And so I can have a signal that feels a magnetic field of the magnet, of the big magnet in the spectrometer, plus the magnetic field of my neighbor, if it aligns with. But I can also feel the magnetic field of the magnet minus a little bit of my neighbor if it's aligned against. Okay. And so that gives me two different frequencies. That's why a single peak in an NMR will appear as a doublet if it has one neighbor. Because that neighbor has an opportunity to either be aligned with the magnetic field of the spectrometer <coughs> or against the field of the spectrometer. And that gives two different frequencies. Okay? That's the easiest one to really understand. When you start to start talking about two neighbors, now you have a lot of different combinations of the magnetic fields, right? I can have both A and B, my, my nearest neighbors, be aligned with or against, or one up and one down. And it can either it can be both of them. And that's why I get this ratio that you see of like one to two to one. One to two to one. It's all about probability. Quantum, the quantum world only works on probability, right? And so uh, that's how you can get a triplet out of this. So we'll finish up on this on Wednesday and get into the next chapter as well. We're going to skip through all this for right now. We'll talk about that next time. And we have a quiz. So turn in 1040. 1040. At 1040.